and welcome back to Multiverse. I want to thank everybody for joining us again. Tonight we're going to be talking about the appeal of the gumshoe on the geek science track, science fiction track here at Multiverse. So first of all, before we get started, uh, if you get a chance, please do consider donating to this year's charity by going to ko-fi.com slash multiverse.com. This year's charity is the Equal Justice Initiative that can be found at eji.org. And also, if you're looking to support Multiverse and the convention, think about going by multiverse.org and go pick up some swag. You can also find out all the different events that are going on this weekend, find out where your favorite panelists are, and last but not least, swing by multiversecon.org forward slash discord to join the discord channel to get the full multiverse experience. So before we dive in and get into any of the fun this evening, I want everybody to go around and make a quick introduction. Uh, Freddie, I'm going to start with you. Hello, my name is Freddie Silva. I'm a fantasy author living in Charlotte, North Carolina. Dana? Hey, I'm Dana Cameron. I write uh, crime fiction with six uh, archaeology mysteries, because that's my background, and three urban fantasy mysteries also with a, uh, a detective. And I'm outside of Boston, Massachusetts. John? Hi, I'm John Hartness. I'm the founder and publisher of Falstaff Books. I write multiple series, and this is Puck, and he'll be stealing the show this evening. It's not Zoom till we have a cat. And Ariel? Hi, I'm Ariel Burgess, and I'm a professional illustrator. I'm best known for doing official art for the Wheel of Time series for about eight years. Uh, and I worked with uh, film companies and people like Stan Lee. Cool. And I'm Jim Nettles. I will be your moderator. Uh, I am a science fiction and fantasy author, as well as nonfiction, uh, founder of Author Essentials. Uh, and I am also one of the founders, along with John, of the Continual Convention. So, uh, tonight we're talking about gumshoes, private investigators, you know, the great noir. So, since we've got a lot of urban fantasy uh, going here, why don't we start there? But what do you think is really the key appeal of, you know, the private detective genre to start with, just in general? Uh, Ariel, let's start with you. Um, I, I think it's an easy format to follow. Uh, and especially uh, for me, when I'm really stressed out, that's actually the first thing that I'll go for instead of something like really happy because it's like, it's a mystery. You have a goal, you have uh, inquisitiveness. And then often they're in settings that you can either easily create in your imagination or that you already know, like, like the Dresden Files is in Chicago. So John, any, anything you want to add to that? Well, no, I agree. I think that the private investigator in particular is something that's relatable because we can, there's, a, there's an element of the every person in the private investigator. They, your protagonist, oh, well, bye. Your protagonist may not be a member of official law enforcement. They may not be a government operative, they may just be some schmo or happen to be the smartest man in the room who's addicted to cocaine and horrible violin playing. They may just be the little old lady down the lane or the little old mystery novelist who, if you see her name in your upcoming reservations and you own a and b leave town, someone's dying. Um, it makes them relatable. And I'm with Ariel. I default to procedurals. I just started my third watch, my third watch through of Criminal Minds. So I'm with you. Ready. Yeah. Um, for me, one of the things about uh, this type of genre is the the setting, the society, if you will, it seems like uh, if you, especially if you look at the ones we're talking about tonight, they're all set in uh, non-standard or, or a different part of society. You know, it's uh, uh, you have the um, I'm trying to think of uh, one in particular that, like uh, you know, you have the the wizard society or the hidden unseelie court, which is different from our society. You have the uh, dark side of the law, 
So it's always this darker society compared to what we're seeing and, and you're getting a different view of things uh, in this kind of genre. So I think that's part of it. What do you think, Dana? I think um, I agree with everyone so far. I also think that there's a lot of the same DNA in the noir uh, procedural as there is in fantasy and in horror. So you could, it, those elements sort of blend themselves very nicely uh, for the purposes of this particular panel. And I think there too, um, with the plot of a mystery or a procedural, you have the structure right there. And that in itself can be very, um, I think as, as Ariel and John were saying, can be very reassuring um, when you need you know, to escape. And then finally, I think, um, you know, sort of touching on what Freddie was saying, there's a bit of being the outsider in society uh, as the gumshoe often is. Um, might have a code, may just be, you know, uh, messed up cocaine, uh, violin playing, uh, you know, denizen of London. But um, there's always someone who's looking at the society from the outside. And that's always, I mean, at least for me, a lot of fun. It's to see things from a different perspective. So that's actually where I want to go next, is to talk about looking at noir fiction, looking at the gumshoe as being that blend between trying to do something in effect that is investigation, potentially law enforcement, or, you know, just dispensing justice, whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you're looking at somebody that's an outsider. Yep. Um, you know, maybe they're an ex-cop that's gotten the boot out the door. You've got somebody that's wizard for hire that's going to burn the building down when they walk in the door. Uh, you've got somebody who is always challenged and a bit on the outs. And so because they're starting in kind of that outcast sort of mode, is that something that also makes for that kind of that tragic figure, even though they're trying to do often the right thing for the wrong reasons um, or other times the wrong thing for the right reason. So if you're starting to work from that, that aspect, is that something that really I think appeals to people is because that's the gumshoe that's working outside the system often because they don't have a choice to do what needs to be done. So John, I'm going to throw that to you. Sure. Um, from a reader perspective, all of those things, we, our culture glorifies the stoic loner, the misunderstood outcast, the anti-hero, the bad boy, the, the tough, broken hero, all of those things are things that we culturally have built, built up in our society as fictional characters. We don't actually like them in real life, no. but we like them in our fiction. From a writer's standpoint, well, it's easy because there's a shorthand. Everyone knows these things. Dana writes books about really smart, really highly educated people because she's Sometimes. smart and highly educated. <laughs> I write books about drunken rednecks. <laughs> write what you know. Ex you can extrapolate whatever you like, but the detective is such a piece of our DNA that for, for a writer, it's an easy place to start. It gives you some place. You can go interesting places because you know where you're starting from. Oh, like, can I, oh, go ahead, Dana. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say that sometimes I write about highly educated drunken people as well. Um, but um, I'm well, sorry, I didn't I mean to interrupt. I dropped out of grad school, so I know all <laughs> about getting getting high and educated. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, that's not what they meant by higher education, but we'll go with that. So, Dana, I'll go ahead and go to you since we've gotten started. Okay. Um, there's a couple of things. I think when you're particularly talking about noir, you have... There are no good choices as far as I'm concerned. There's always, there's no way the protagonist can win 100%. There's only a choice of bad choices. And I think that's really appealing because sometimes that feels like that's what we have. Um, and sometimes it's reassuring to see a character going through the same thing and doing the best they can. I think, um, Jim, you were talking about the idea of law and being outside. I think there's also the question of what's legal and what's just. 
And I think that's a huge thing and I, um, that um, comes into play in a lot of mystery fiction, but particularly in noir. And then I think um, talking about outsiders, when I'm not writing about um, highly strong and highly uh, educated academics, um, my Fangborn series, uh, Jerry, um, the, uh, oh gosh, sorry, the screen's just gone away. Um, Jerry Steuben is a, is a PI and he is Fangborn. He is a werewolf. But the thing is, he can't um, show the outside world that he's a werewolf. So instead of having everyone believe, um, he has to work on the outside because he can't be seen on the crime scene. And what I like about that is that he has to be doing sort of a, an extra dance to work and bring justice and sometimes, um, you know, bring the law to bear. But oftentimes it's justice that is outside the law. So what you want to add to that, Freddie? Yeah, I think uh, what John said about the anti-hero, I feel like it's kind of like uh, you have typically these type of stories are pretty close in the head of the of the protagonist, right? And uh, it's kind of a flawed character, but very human. So often they make uh, poor decisions, burn down buildings, do things that, uh, and when you're riding along as a reader, you're thinking, no, no, what are you doing this for? But at the same time, you can really get into the character because of uh, that flaw and that very humanness of the character. And I, I feel like that's a big part of this genre as well. Uh, oftentimes there's, you know, no good, no good uh, solution, you know, and they're trying to do the best they can. What do you think, Ariel? I think in part, it also, we relate to it because it's often somebody who takes a lot of hits and gets knocked down and again and again and again. And I think most people in their lives can find a point in which they relate to that. And it's nice to read a character that is having a hard time and, and either finding a way through it or finding something, a sense of purpose and making things right that we can, can all kind of lean towards. I think it's why it's a genre that's lasted so long. I, I know for me, I, I end up leaning towards those because I've taken a lot of hits and, and I feel like a lot of the time I just want to give these characters a hug because I know how hard it is. Well, also, Ariel, I think on that, uh, it, like if they're going to burn something down, you kind of want to burn things down. Every yeah. In a while. You want to go. I want to burn a lot of stuff down sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It would be nice to do that, but we, we, we won't. Can't. We can't <laughs> yeah. but we can I'll burn the water fluid. <laughs> we have to do it uh you have to do it the, the right way yeah guess, because right because way. you can't do it you want to see the character do it is that part of what it is you want to see them let themselves go i guess i i, I guess it's that um dealing with things in a way that we can't always deal with them in a re in real life i'm not allowed to blow up nearly as much stuff as my characters <laughs> i don't think it's at all fair <laughs> you can do it there's just different implications <laughs> and I can't afford that bail um, <laughs> so Freddie I, you know I the first real noir stuff that, that got me you know of course was Sherlock Holmes I mean I, mm -hmm. I remember being a kid and that was one of my first fascinations with Sherlock Holmes and then graduating into the Mike Hammers and things like that before ultimately getting into Dresden Files and, and the stuff that like that that came later. What is it, what was the first thing you really remember from the noir, the detective era that pulled you in? Um, I think uh, Mike Hammer, like you said, the uh, that the whole uh, Mickey Spillane, I think it is, the, mm -hmm. does that series. I've read some of those books and it's just that whole feel of it, you know, the, the uh, gumshoe tough tough guy thing. Uh, and of course, uh, um, the Dresden Files is obviously, I mean, it's one of my favorite series. So that one's, that one definitely pulled me in a lot more into the fantasy sci-fi side of it. What about you, Dana? Uh, I, I think it's interesting that you, you called out Sherlock Holmes as, uh, as noir, Jim, because when I write pastiche, when I write Sherlock and pastiche, it's, it's always with the question, why would two um, well-educated, reasonably well-off gentlemen in London and Victorian times be spending all their time with the underbelly of society. 
And I find that fascinating as a writer. Um, I think they're terrific uh, adventure stories. I don't think they're great as mysteries because they cheat. But on the other hand, I think that whole issue of looking at the machinations politically and, you know, uh, criminally and of the street in, in that area is, is, is tremendous fun. And so that's why I like to write that. In terms of reading, I think um, it would have been the, the more, uh, you know, familiar stuff um, like Cain and Hammett and, um, and, and that, and just, and, and uh, Raymond Chandler, and just the idea that uh, you have the, that one person who lives outside of society and yet still can survive and make a living um, by observing it, which I find fascinating. Well, and like I say, I, I have always, it took me a while to get there, but looking at Sherlock Holmes, mm -hmm. looking at those stories, that's one of those things that sort of adapted that idea that really it, it, it is early noir. Yeah. Um, because you see they're outsiders, but it's almost they're outsiders by choice instead mm -hmm. of a lot of the time we see outsiders by circumstance or, or whatever else. It was really much more of they, Sherlock Holmes made a conscious choice because he didn't fit in the rest of that society. And then he went deeper. So instead of faking it, faking his way through higher society, he elected to dive into that CD underbelly because that's what was interesting. Sure. And I think the reason for John Watson being part of that is also very interesting. I mean, these days we would look at it in terms of PD, um, oh gosh, um, PDSD. Am I getting PTSD, the yeah. Yeah. Um, and th in those days it would have been shell shock or something else. And I think the way that you need that kind of, um, you need stimulus after you've been through something like that. Um, but also, I think it's interesting, you said that he didn't opt to sort of try to blend in where Mycroft did. Mycroft is one of the most antisocial people on the planet, and yet he is the British government. Mm -hmm. um, and um, they often work so far outside the line. I think everyone, it's, it's very interesting to me when readers look at Sherlock Holmes and say, he stands for truth and, and, and right and everything, but he murders people, mm -hmm. says, I won't worry about him, he wasn't very good. He does all sorts of things um, and gets away with it because of the result he brings in. And that's very much in that PI and noir vein, I think. So what about you, Ariel? Uh, what have I read that's noir? Um, well, what kind of brought you to it? What what attracts you to it? What and keeps you with it? But, I kind of fell into it. Um, I started with fantasy. Um, I'm very dyslexic, so it's very hard for me to read something. And if I read it, it has to has to really keep me because it's a lot of work to get through a book for someone who's as dyslexic as dyslexic lydexic as I am. Um, and uh, so I kind of I kind of fell into it and I, I kind of went backwards. I um, tried reading Sherlock Holmes and then started reading Dresden and then went back to reading Sherlock Holmes and I've dabbled in reading uh, checking. I'm interested in Perry Mason mm -hmm. um, and the HBO series that recently came out and haven't haven't seen that yet. Uh, but yeah, I, I kind of fell into to Dresden pretty hard. And that was, I guess, my gateway because it, uh, I, I related a lot to a lot of the characters. I'm also five foot like Murphy. Um, and I've dated very, very tall people. Um, and uh, I, I liked the, like I said before, I liked the, the taking hits. Um, I also really liked the fact that Butcher um, did his research on the, uh, on paganism and on the religions that he um, that he kind of draws from, and and not in a through a Christian lens way, which was really really refreshing because mm -hmm. I I grew up um, pagan, and so it was really really nice to see things like uh, Mab and the Fae handled with proper care and research and information, um, and I liked I always I was gravitated towards things that were a little I, I guess. I guess we tend to see things that are dark as deeper and um, easier to connect to. Um, when when times are tough for me, I don't I don't want to watch comedies and things that make me laugh. I want to watch stuff that's dark and to the point because nobody has time for that. Like I want to get to the point. <laughs> um, so yeah, I guess I guess I would say my my gateway would have been Dresden. So John, what about you? So I haven't read a ton of Holmes, 
I've read some, but not a ton. Um, and I don't read that much actual noir, just because I prefer to read things that are written in a contemporary style. So obviously I read a ton of Dresden, um, the early Anita Blake stuff, Kim Harrison. But what got me into detective stories were the kids' detective books. Encyclopedia Brown, The Hardy Boys, Nancy Drew, Trixie Belden. I was devouring those as a child, 9, 10, 11 years old. And then it was just a logical progression that as I got older, the detectives I read about got older. But the Mike Hammers and those square jaw, tough guy, 1940s gumshoe, that's never really been my thing because I'm kind of a bumbling idiot. So I can't relate to these very competent, tough guys. I can kind of relate to the gangly dork who LARPs and burns down his apartment building on accident, you know? I can, I can relate to that. But also, starting with those children's detective stories, that also kept me very interested in some of the comedic mm -hmm. elements of noir. Some of the stuff like Christopher Moore's San Francisco Vampire mm -hmm. stories they have a heavy noir element to them and they're hilarious because Christopher Moore is a genius. Yes. Um, Paul Barrett's um, The Malay's Falchion that we published last year is a great high fantasy noir dwarf detective comedy. And I like things that throw pieces into the blender and whir them up like that. So... I started off with the little kid stuff and now have just moved into everything. Yeah, I guess that you bring that up that that definitely kind of, I guess we all kind of absorb that when we're kids um, and read a lot of those. And I, I forgot to mention Nora Roberts. I'm a big Nora Roberts mm -hmm. fan and she does a lot of detective books that are fantastic and they, while everyone's lives are, you know, they have money and those kinds of things tend to be figured out. Um, they do have a good element, I think, of, of mixing genres. And I think you're, you're right, John, that there has to be some kind of, like, it, it can't all be dark and gritty. There's moments of comedy and levity in life, no matter what, um, is all the gamut of emotions. Yeah, you know, one of my favorite thriller, dark detective series in recent years is Rachel Kane's Stillwater mm -hmm. Creek books. If you've ever wanted to learn how to write a thriller, go read those books because they're a masterclass in how to craft a thriller. And those, th that protagonist is, has been horribly beaten up like you were talking about, but she's still going. The ones where I, the ones where it's too much for me are like, oh, what is it, Dark Places by Gillian Flynn? Mm -hmm. That one was too much. She was too broken. She was broken to the point of, for me, being unlikable. And talked about how unlikable she was. And I believed her. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the well, that's the thing. tells you she's terrible for 200-something pages, I I'm probably going to buy it. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. If, if someone is unlikable, I think that's perfectly fine in a protagonist, as long as they are fascinating or competent or there's another hook that you're rooting for them, even though you, do, you don't like them. They have the skill or they have the insight or they have the drive to do something. But if someone is telling you, like if, if someone tells you they're awful, then yeah, you should believe them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and I think that kind of goes in a good spot as well is what is going to push you out of it? Where are you going to say it, exactly that? It's gone too far. I found, I actually empathize more with whoever the antagonist is um, instead of the protagonist in some of these stories. So if you're looking at that, and especially if you're crafting the story, there's that fine line between I've got a broken human being, but how broken is my toy? Mm -hmm. You know, how much are they super glued back together? And 
one of the things that we we don't necessarily see in the in the genre is whether or not they see personal growth and personal development or if they're just the same broken toy story to story to story to story. I think that's where you start to get the trope of the, you have the uh, very interested and engaged and engaging protagonist character, but then you have the, bo the broken best friend who's willing to do anything and is violent and is a bit of a psychopath. And you see that often because, you, you know, so I had to call so-and-so, I had to call Hawk, I had to call in Win if you're reading the, um, uh, oh gosh, I can't come up with them. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. But it just, it's always that friend that's held in reserve to do the things that we don't want to see the character do. And at that point, the, the protagonist character, and at that point, I, I tend to get a little no, let's take some ownership for our own awfulness, I guess, is one way of putting it. But um, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting line where you're trying to keep a character so likable, but they're still friends with this person who will do horrible things at their behest. Right. And I think that the character has to have some type of moral compass. It doesn't have to be the same as mine, yep. but it has to be something that keeps them on the straight and narrow, whatever their straight and narrow is. Uh, you know, if they if they don't have that, that you don't feel them trying to pull themselves back from the edge, then it's hard to uh, stay interested in the character. Yeah. Oh, it's um, it's in Harlan Coben's novels. The the psychotic sidekick friend is named Win. Sorry, found it. You got to save the cat. It's a it's a film. It's a screenwriting term. You've got to have something early in the book or series to make you care about this character, to show that this character isn't just awful. Mm -hmm. You know, Harry Dresden could get away with a ton of stuff because we've seen him care about Molly, care about the dog, care about the cat, care about his kid. He can sick his, psycho his psychotic half of brother vampire on whoever he needs to because he saved the cat mm -hmm. and the world but my cat's also sitting the cat. right here so he we care more about that but that's if you don't save the cat i've got to feel like the protagonist is is a little better than me i want to aspire to be like the character at at some level. If I'm reading Dana's books, I'm like, I wish I was that smart, you know? <laughs> John, I cheat. <laughs> I figure out that's something I take a long time to figure out. I'm not as smart as my characters. I, I take like four weeks for them to have one good idea. So cheat. <laughs> oh, yeah. There's a reason that all of my characters use one of five firearms because I only had to learn about five firearms. I don't know crap about guns, except those five. <laughs> yeah. I have one, one pet uh, model that I use because I, I learned on that. So, but yeah, I think, I think that idea of aspiring to the character, whether it's physical courage or moral courage, or just being able to take a beating, you know, there, there's something in that, that you, um, I think I agree. It's, you, you want to, relate to that. And if you have enough of that, you can get away with unlikable. Well, it's kind of like Ariel said a few times, the characters have taken a beating and we go to these books and these characters when we feel like we're taking yeah. a beating. We need a little more Chumbawamba yeah. in our lives. Mm -hmm. And sometimes a really good character who gets knocked down and gets back up again, mm -hmm. help, helps us. Yeah. Well, and do you think that this is also one of those surges that goes back to the idea of the anti-hero? I mean, because a lot of the time the noir detective is truly much more of an anti-hero than necessarily the hardcore hero. So I don't know, Ariel, any opinion on that one? Um, well, I don't think anybody, well, I, I'm sure there are, I don't want to make general statements, but I think most people don't feel like they're pure good or, or pure chaos. And so we kind of relate more to the anti-hero and we don't 
most people don't want to be Superman. Um, there are some people that would, would love to be Superman and are very that way. And a lot of people don't like being friends with that person because it's <laughs> less fun. <laughs> um, but I think I don't know, there's something more real about having um, a deeper backstory and a deeper, a harder life where things don't just always go right. Um, and where, you know, you may have problems and you may be more angry a lot of the time or, um, but like John was saying, not so broken that it's just a therapy session for, you know, a bunch of books. Um, but I think it's more relatable. Freddie, you want to take a shot of that? Well, uh, I think I had said earlier the the we want to relate to somebody that is human. Nobody's perfect, right? You don't want the knight in shining armor that is never makes a mistake. Uh, so the I don't know if the if it's the anti-hero because that's kind of a, a specific trope, if you will. But just that flawed human, like I said earlier, or the human that that makes mistakes and um, realizes them, tries to make, get them tries to get better and is trying to improve themselves throughout the whole thing. Uh, I think uh, that's most of the, these characters are going down a path, but they're, they're trying to do right. And they're trying to, you know, go the right way, but they keep running into obstacles and they keep trying to fight against their nature, if you will. So uh, again, it's just a human thing and, and we all can relate to that. I think there's a, there's that place like you don't necessarily want to be Superman and you definitely don't want to be Batman. Mm -hmm. You want to find some place in between. I mean, that's why I like, um, you know, Captain America keeps getting back up, can do it all day. Mm -hmm. Captain Marvel gets up and says like, oh, I've been, okay, spoiler alert, I've been duped. I should be doing this my way. Um, like the, the Miles Morales character in the, in the latest Spider, um, Into the Spider-Verse movie. Again, you just keep getting back up because you have to. And that's what I, that's the thing, I think for me, I mean, there can be any kind of gradation in terms of, of niceness or likability, but it's just, you keep getting back up and trying to do your best. And I find that I, that's the thing I look for. You know, so. I think uh, if you're talking like the superhero thing, I'm looking more at the Hulk where mm. mild mannered, uh, trying to do the best thing I can. And then you get me mad and then I'm just going to go off and Smash. And then when I come back, it's like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> well, I think you make a good point with like Captain America because he has like this moral code and a sense of pride and um, purpose in something. And he believes in something so wholeheartedly. Um, and for him, it's, you know, the, the American ideal of the time that he's from. And the, I don't want to say yeah, but a code of, of a path and um, or Batman. I mean, nobody wants to have that much misfortune and loneliness. <laughs> I mean, it's the money that, sounds yeah. nice. But <laughs> um, I, I just went to the place with the, um, the lobster Thermidor in the uh, Lego Batman movie. Um, that sounds like fun. But, but yeah, it's like even, I mean, but the thing is with Captain America, he's willing to go outside the law. He's not such a good at two shoes. I mean, he always does the right thing. And sometimes that can be a little bit painful. But then it's like, well, his friend's in trouble. And he knows that isn't right. So, he, I mean, he's willing to go outside the bounds to, to deal with that. I'm talking strictly about the movies at this point because um, it's well, been a while since uh, I've caught up on most of my comic books. They've read yeah. the comics so many times that anything we say, anything you and I have read in the comics has probably been invalidated three times by now. Multiverse. So, but yeah. Yay, multiverse. <laughs> you know, you talk, about, you talk about Cap being willing to go outside the law. Mm. He's always going to fight for Bucky. Yep. Mm -hmm. Despite the fact that Bucky is an assassin. He is a murderer has killed more people than cholera. <laughs> but he's still Bucky. Mm -hmm. So Cap has that shining faith in redemption. Bucky's the one I want to write. <laughs> <laughs> or, but, or Black Widow, for example. You know, oh, yeah. um, mm -hmm. trying to like she's got red in her ledger and it's dripping, but he feels like she's trying to do the right thing. And I, I I like that, but yeah, she's she's gonna be more fun to write. So well, in, the, 
if you wrote Hawkeye according mm -hmm. to his backstory, you could make a really great, well, Matt Fraction did make a great mm -hmm. Hawkeye series, but but we can talk comic books all day. Yeah, it's like we're going down a rat hole here. <laughs> yeah, we're wrong rabbit hole. Yep. So, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, but wouldn't Batman also be considered a, it's a noir, it's, oh. it's mm -hmm. a gumshoe story. And when you strip out the superhero part, I mean, he's misfortunate. He has, he gets been knocked down and he has to, he's fighting the underbelly of, of Gotham. And I, a lot of people, he's so popular, I think, because people relate to Batman for that very reason that he isn't super powered. He is, he's very smart and he has lots of money, but he's, um, he has been knocked down a lot and he wants to help people regardless of how hard his life has been. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think there's an interesting idea there with Batman individually that he started out as the greatest detective and migrated to become the dark Knight. Mm -hmm. yep. So that's an arc into and of itself. And I think part of that reflects obviously the times that he was being written in, but I mean, we've gone from, from a Batman who, was still up fighting truth, justice, you know, take out the bad guys, but that wasn't going to kill anybody to now, you know, we, we see the dark Knight. We see, you know, the much grittier, you know, side of Batman. Do we think that that's a good allegory for way we've seen even the noir, the noir fiction go? I think it's a cycle <laughs> because Batman, the very first image of Batman was him swinging on a, on a rope, holding a gun. Mm -hmm. Batman shot people. <laughs> so it's a cycle. When a lot of these, the first time we saw Captain America, he was punching, a, he was punching a Nazi, uh, still punching Nazis today. So it's, as we are incapable of learning from history, our heroes and anti-heroes have to keep teaching us the same lessons over and over again. So when you have these heavy societal backlashes against thing, in the 60s you had all this revolution and all kinds of cultural upheaval and you had Burt Ward and Adam West. So you had shiny, happy Batman. And then you got Michael Keaton, who was pretty dark. And then you had bat nipples. And then you had Christopher Nolan. But now from everything that they've been saying in the, in the press, the Robert Pattinson film is supposed to be a return to the detective story. Hmm. So it's, it's a cycle. I think, I think there's that, that, that reference that I think people used um, to describe like Mozart, Everyone, every, every decade gets the Mozart that they deserve. Like they, they create an idea of a particular character and it's either he's the infant prodigy of the, you know, the 18th and 19th century or he's the, you know, foul mouth um, uh, grifter of the 80s, 1980s. But I think, you know, we, we sort of, can look at where we are in society like do we have do we have mutants looking after us do we have jack reacher looking after us do we have sherlock holmes in many different aspects and i think it's just a real good way either it's something that people want to see because it's reflecting a lot of how they feel or it's something they need to see because it it's something they need to feel that they're not feeling at the moment it's just a very psychological and, and hand wave right there i'm sorry so i'd be sorry about <laughs> darker the times, the darker the character, so you can relate to them better? I had read it was kind of the opposite for uh, like what's popular in music. The harder times are, the more happy the music sounds. And I think, and it's because people need something. And I, I think at the same time with that happy music, you still have stories like Batman that are still so, or film noir that are still so, um, they reach everybody because you can, you again you are going through a difficult time and it's something to to lean into but you know, we have that cycle with batman because it's i know things were a little could have been i guess a little easier and and so 
you have the the really dark Christopher Nolan Batman and and things are getting harder now and so we need we need a little a little levity and a little easier to follow story and something that's a little more like immersive mm-hmm. yeah i i find that i can write the darkest stuff the horror the noir easier when i am feeling quite safe and when i'm mm-hmm. feeling comfortable at home and when i'm not it's difficult to write anything because i can't write something you know, super happy, but it's also hard. It's like, really, do I want to go onto this, into this misery? But mm-hmm. I think, I think you're right there, Ariel, um, in terms of it's the tonic for what, you know, the, the moment needs. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, if we still had real conventions and bars, we could meet in the bar and I could talk about being a comedy writer in 2020. Yeah, well, uh, yeah. nobody. What in the world do you write as satire now? <laughs> Even Falstaff wouldn't buy 2020 as a script. Um, so what about the other side of it? Creating the antagonist, finding the antagonist to balance out against the hero. Uh, you know, if you've got the damage, you know, protagonist is coming in, how do you then create the antagonist that you're going against? How do you set that story up and in, in going through? Because a lot of the time we see that the antagonist looks to be the good law-abiding billionaire. Um or you know, it's the uh, the quote unquote apparently innocent person. Your your protagonist is having to chase that mystery, part of which means they're in essence running down somebody who often is seen as you know higher strata of society, or somebody who has wealth, who has power, and it's you know it's a bit of that David and Goliath scenario. Well, I think that a lot of times in, in this type of genre, the it's the mystery writing. Um, you don't always know who the antagonist is, is a part of it, right? Is a, the part of the gen- journey of the protagonist is trying to figure out who's out to get them and who that antagonist is. And oftentimes the antagonist from book one ends up being, you know, maybe a friend in book two, you know, they weren't really an antagonist. So uh, I think the, it's almost fluid in this type of, of uh, writing. I think in a way it goes to that, as John was saying earlier, that line. And I think it's somebody that often has fallen off that line, um, who has lost their sense of hope and lost that sense of maybe, you know, of levity, but could be the main character, could easily be the hero or the antagonist, but ends up being... um, Ends up, ends up falling off that line that our character is straddling. Mm-hmm. The, idea of, the idea of mirrors mm-hmm. play, plays very heavily in the idea of your, your hero and your villain being two sides of the same coin is, I mean, Batman and the Joker are both psychopaths. Mm-hmm. <laughs> They're both nuts. One of them wears makeup, more makeup, and one of them wears his underwear on the outside of his pants. But they're both crazy. Well, and to that front, one of the you know one of the favorite theories that I always loved is the idea that Alfred really is the Joker to give Batman purpose and meaning. So, if you're looking at kind of that idea, in a lot of these cases it is the antagonist that gives our characters purpose and meaning. I mean, obviously that's what creates the story and the conflict, but that mirror effect you've got to create means trying to create somebody you're going after as that antagonist that sets up the situation, but that looks like they can't be conquered. And sometimes it's a matter of the fact that the detective is the one that has to go outside the boundaries to be able to win. Hmm. And welcome to season two of The Boys, mm-hmm. because that's the overarching plot. But, you know, is it the antagonist or is it actually the mystery itself uh, trying to find the answer? I mean, that's kind of the, this genre, right? You're trying to find the answer. The antagonist is one of the, the things that are in your way trying to stop you. But the, a, lot of, a lot of times it's not trying to defeat a certain person. It's trying to find a certain thing or or the answer to the mystery, right? So that's why I think the antagonist a lot of times is fluid because sometimes they help you, sometimes they don't, sometimes they're on your side, sometimes you're not, but you're really trying to find that answer, right? 
I've been trying to think about uh, the the mirror idea that that Jim and and John touched on, and I'm the novel. Um, one of the novels my agent is shopping around now is an 18th century noir. And the thing is, it's not so much that it's a mystery, it's, it's a crime story. And everyone but the protagonist is an antagonist. There's very mm -hmm. seldom does she run into someone who is not an antagonist. And that's where I, I mentioned before about, you know, there being nothing but bad options open to you. And that for me is the heart of noir. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting to me to find when she ran into, there are two or three people who aren't antagonist and her responses to them the, the main character's response is quite different one of them is sort of a you know a partner um a co-conspirator co who stays very much in the wings we don't know much about her yet but there's someone else who is actually the local constable and he's trying to help this person and she's like what do you want from me i don't understand this no one else in my life behaves like this you must want something and i can't see it yet and so it's just it's more like the the reflection of her own, um, the protagonist, who's really not a very nice person, it's a reflection of hers onto everyone else. That's how she sees the world, as as uh, everyone has their angle, everyone is out to get her. And usually she has that response for a good reason, but um, it's it, it's not necessarily a lot of fun to write that. <laughs> it can be engaging, it can be challenging, but at the end of the day, I was like, oh, all these people are terrible. I want to see what happens tomorrow, but not now. I need to take a break now. But it's it's interesting um, when you when you start looking for an antagonist. What what form will that take? I think a good uh, example is all of the iterations of Professor Moriarty. Um, like the new Sherlock, he's a lot more. Uh, the one with um, Benedict Cumberbatch. Uh, mm -hmm. He's a lot more. I think relatable and less of like oh this is the villain and he is a lot close to a mirror image of uh sherlock whereas other iterations of him he's he is the big more the big bad and really i think the newer version is a good example of it being more about the mystery and and less about his constant struggle with moriarty and how well, he's just a flawed individual Yep. Yeah, the, the thing I liked about that Moriarty was it was almost chaotic madness versus controlled madness. Mm -hmm. And I think that that Moriarty, that representation of Moriarty was, it, it, it almost felt like a, that joker, that anarchy, that I'm, I'm creating this out of boredom. I'm creating this, uh, and it was the dependency between the two that made that story so much stronger. And I think that's what we see, you know, going back to the books a bit more was not necessarily that same level of madness, but I think that's one of the things that really came out and made that series stand out much more to me was you saw Moriarty that was absolutely convicted. And I think it was much more about the situation and him creating the mystery for Sherlock to have to figure out how to get his way out of. And I think that was one of the things that really set up the, BB, the most current BBC Sherlock. Yeah, I think because um, for one thing, that Moriarty was charismatic, whereas so many Moriarty's are like, I'm the bad guy, I run the evil in this town, I'm the spider in the web. Whereas in the BBC Sherlock, um, he was very much that. In fact, I kind of, in that, I see him, uh, Moriarty, Sherlock, and Mycroft as three of a, three of a pair, if you will, three of mm -hmm. a kind. Um, but very much creating the stories to keep each other, the, the, or the problems to keep each other engaged in some ways. Um, but you know, uh, we all find our way to, <laughs> we all find our way to fight boredom, and and theirs is just written on a larger scale, and sometimes involves exploding people, and uh, buildings, and 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 such. I'm not advocating that. I'm just speaking from a writer's point of view. Absolutely, percent not advocating that. <laughs> So, you know, since we're looking at that, I know we're kind of coming up on time. So from each of your perspective, what represents the noir genre, the modern noir genre that you think everybody should look at, see, and read? You know, for me, there's two stories that really in the last number of years that, that solidified it for me. Um, the first of which is Michael Williams' um, Fall of Autumn, and the second of which is Rich Cadry's um, grand dark 
And I read those two back to back and I wish I had reversed the order in them, but reading those two stories um, as dark as they were still had that small sense of hope going throughout. Mm -hmm. You may not know how that hope is going to come about and it, and it resulted in very different ways between the two stories. But for me, that was one of those things that really represented where we're at now, even though one is hard science fiction, uh, you know, where they're both really science he have heavy science fiction elements as well. But for you, what's a story that you would tell people go out and read and why? What are you looking for that, that would give some people some of that today? And of course, everyone's reading list has just fled their heads because yeah, that's the worst course. question to ask. Well, Nettle stole one of mine. So you're welcome. That would absolutely echo <laughs> a fall in autumn. Um, and I'll go back to Malay's Falchion just because it's fun and light and still checks all the noir detective boxes, but without getting into the dark depths of something like The Grand Dark, which is a heavy book. Um, but you still have your grizzled, drunken detective. He just happens to be a dwarf. And there might be a talking sword. And these things happen. You just have to deal with them. So that's probably one that, yeah, those two. Well, while you're all working on reading lists. <laughs> Um, so the, the one other thing I want to kind of go into is if you look at the genre and you're, if you're working on writing, wanting to create characters in the genre, you're wanting to create the story in the genre, what's one thing these days you would like to see pulled out of it, or at least not as much of a focus that has been, but still keep the same feel, the same flavor. So if somebody's trying to start writing that now, what's kind of the twist you would like to put on it? but still keep the flavor. I want to well, see stuff not written by white people. I want to see, I want to see Asian noir. I want to see noir set in the streets of New Delhi. I want to see something in, I want to see something in Hong Kong. Um, yeah, so yeah. that's, I want to see, I want to see stuff from, um, from other people and I want to see it in other parts of the world because we can still have the same tone, um, but we can, we can use, we can be exposed to different cultures and different chunks of the universe. In that respect, um, John, I don't know if you know about the Akashic series City Noir, where they have, they, they take a city, they have one editor who's usually a fairly big name, and they divide it up amongst uh, genre writers and people who don't write in genre, and everyone takes a chunk of the city, and they write a noir story set there, and you can get the entire, uh, you know, range of everything. Um, and um, for example, I did Boston where I did the North End. Everyone expected me to write about um, the Italian mob in the North End. But of course, I figured, hey, I don't know anything about that, but I know about crime in the 18th century. So I said it there because a waterfront is a waterfront. Um, the other thing, um, just to, Jim, to get back to what you were talking about, what, what I've seen recently, it's not so much a detective story is that there's a, a crime that needs to be solved. And um, Sean Cosby's... Um, blacktop wasteland it's not necessarily i'm sorry not a crime to be solved but a, a, someone who has to get out of a crime that he's being asked to commit and how can he do that and keep everyone alive and i can't recommend it highly enough and that is what um sean refers to it as um country noir written by an african-american author it's fabulous i really adore that book and it's a lot of fun it's uh it's it's dark, it's gritty, but it's also got a lot of, of um, humor and cheekiness to it. So just 
to tie those together. I finally came up with a book I've read in the past 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> I'm having the same problem. Um, to answer a couple of your questions, I, uh, a series that I would recommend, I usually recommend the Dresden Files. One, because the reason I recommend it is because he starts off very young and he grows a lot as a character and as a person. And I think that that's, uh, that's really worth reading it for beyond the fact that he does all this research, research and everything. And the characters are also people that you would want to have like in your life. They're the types of people, they're people you can rely on. Um, as for things I'd like to change, I'd, I would like to read other perspectives and not in Boston, Chicago, or New York City. Um, I'm from DC originally. I'd like to read a lot more stories about DC. It's an incredibly cool city, and all you hear is stuff about politics. Um, and you know, it has a lot of history there beyond beyond politics. Um, and the other thing I'd like to see taken out of it is a lot more, uh, a lot less of the violence against women. Um, pretty much, a noir, a lot of noir series are there's either a rape or a murder of a woman, and it's it's beyond tiresome. Like, yes, we know we're the we're the ones that were mostly preyed on, but it uh, it uh, gets it's it's you stop seeing them as people, mm -hmm. and uh, so I, I'd I'd like to see more um, people of color. I'd like to see more women who are, mm -hmm. and uh, that's part of why I ended up reading a lot more Nora Roberts because she does women detective stories. Um, so uh, yeah, and fewer women in refrigerators. So yes. Yeah. Yeah. I was absolutely about to say that. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, speaking of uh, stories with women in them, in this, I, I guess it would be in this genre. I actually had to go look at my bookshelf, so I brought it back. But uh, this one right here, Daughter of the Sword, hmm. is by uh, Steve Bain, and it's basically a detective story set in Japan, and it's about uh, um, Japanese katanas that are. Uh, it's called the Faded Blade series, so it's about Japanese katanas that are you know, have magic. And this is a, about a female Japanese, half Japanese, half American detective that is in the middle of trying to figure out what's going on. So it's a pretty good series. Well, we're coming up on time. Um, so I wanna say I appreciate everybody coming on and joining us for the panel. Um, so coming up to wrap up, Give me that one minute sort of thing. What's the one thing you want anybody that wants to get into the noir series writing that? What's the one thing you think they need to know? I think it wouldn't hurt if they knew how to, um, or if they had been in a situation where they had been in a, uh, a controlled situation where you could learn to fight a little bit, learning what it feels like to fight and be hit. Um, I took Krav Maga for three or four years when I was writing my, you know, medium boiled mysteries. And it was really useful because I learned I, uh, so much about how short a fight scene should be because mostly other people will gas out or something. But I think learning something like that where you have just a little bit more uh, of an idea of what all the, what goes into being a tough person, a tough, at least tough guy. Um, uh, I think that makes a lot of difference. If you're gonna have that grit, then you might as well uh, have some, uh, as I said, a controlled experience of it. Yeah, shooting somebody. I, I don't like getting hit, by the way. <laughs> but I know what it's like these days. Yeah, getting shot does not mean you're going to go flying back 10 feet. Yes, yeah. Ariel? And, dislocate, oh. and dislocating your shoulder does not mean that you're going right back to the gym the next day. Yep. yep. No. No. <laughs> um, I also took martial arts uh, for that. Uh, yeah, I, I think I think be inquisitive, uh, be curious, want to learn. I, that's the basis of a noir is a mystery and wanting to solve something, wanting to get the details, wanting to learn other people's perspectives, um, to think how other people are going to think. Uh, and that's being able to put yourself in other characters' shoes, other people's shoes, uh, to think how they might proceed with something or how they might do something or where they might go if they feel unsafe. Um, be empathic. And I think that's kind of what, why noir characters are often so broken is because they're very, they've, been, they've had hard lives, but they're also very empathic people. And it, when, you, when you feel other people's pain so much all of the time, it's very painful. So, yeah. Ready? 
Well, I uh, think definitely the the realistic character that you can get behind, and then uh, obviously it'd be good if uh, I think we all talked about this a little bit is finding a new direction, you know, a new place, a new setting, a new uh, culture to to write this in. And it's okay. important to understand if you want to get into writing noir, detective noir, understand that there's a formula. And if you're looking to write saleable fiction, that there are boxes you're going to have to check or you have to call it something else. You, if you're going to write it and market it as this, it's going to have to check the boxes. So understand the genre. Too many times I run into new writers will say, well, I don't want to read anything in the genre I want to write in because I don't want it to influence me. I have typically profane responses to that that I will uh, leave on the, on the shelf for the evening. But no, you have to know the genre. You have to know, you have to know the cliches so that you can avoid them. If you don't know what Dana means by get, keep the women out of the refrigerator, then you need to research fridging women and understand why it's a trope and a cliche that originated in comic books, actually. But so and then they had to fridge Indiana Jones. Yeah. So well, you that was self-defense. To... Yeah. <laughs> But so, at the same time, you can either you can learn enough to avoid the cliches, or you can subvert them, which is even yes, more interesting. Absolutely. Yeah. But you got to know them because you can't, you're not allowed to break the rules if you don't know the rules. Exactly. Mm -hmm. so. If you know the rules, you can break them with impunity. Well, the same thing covers art. You can't do cartooning if you don't know anatomy. I have had a lot of people come to me and want to learn how to draw and they just draw anime and that's awesome. Love anime. I started there too, but you need to know proper anatomy to play with it. And you can't, you can't do uh, silly cartoons if you don't know why their elbows go where they go. <laughs> Rob Liefeld begs to differ. <laughs> but... Yeah. <laughs> Yes, well, well, now he can and swim in all of the money he has from the Deadpool movies, but um, <laughs> previously he still can't draw feet, so. Or hands. <laughs> or hands, or backs, broken spines, you know, we don't need those. It's cool. Well, guys, I appreciate everybody joining us for this panel. Um, I want to thank my panelists very much for, for going through and having come through to talk about the noir story and the noir journey. And if you enjoyed the panel, please come on and hang out at Morton Multiverse this weekend. Check out the rest of the, uh, the rest of the planning. You can find it at multiverse multiversecon.org. And of course, there's also the Discord channel. And again, remember, uh, supporting the charity if you're so inclined, which you can do at ko-fi.com forward slash multiversecon. And thanks everyone for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for wrangling us. Thank y'all. <laughs>